afternoon everyone welcome to yet another uh, chapter event of association of energy engineers north cal chapter so today we have wade shaw research director of north america power and renewables at wood, wood and mckenzie he is a bs in mechanical engineering from university of pacific he has deep knowledge of electricity markets with over 30 years of experience his expertise is in electricity data sources models and simulation and helps with long range electricity planning he regularly does technical analysis writes articles and is a respected thought leader in the energy markets today's topic is demystifying the texas grid failure and its implications for the energy transition the winter storm yuri which is uh which is uh the why you'll see that name in some of the, in some of these slides um and it's a little bit ironic actually that I ended up being the one that kind of covered this for our team I actually work with a group of individuals that are based in Houston Texas and heading in and I, and normally I don't cover the ERCOT market in detail although I'm well aware of of what's going on there and look at all of North America power markets but uh you know heading into the weekend of the of the 14th of February uh we could already see load forecasts coming out of ERCOT that were suggesting that they might set a, that they would set an all-time uh peak demand uh on on Monday morning um if if the loads if the loads held up which and and that's including higher than their all-time record summer peak uh, what happened though was not only did they not meet that peak and and the reason is there wasn't enough generation to meet the peak and so they had to curtail load but it also took out most of my coworkers uh they were suffering rolling blackouts throughout uh from from Monday morning through Thursday and so i ended up being the one that was remotely logging in and following following the storm and trying to understand what was happening so so that's how kind of how i be, became a quickly became an, somewhat of an expert on it But again, a lot of these uh, materials were put together by other colleagues, and I'm just sharing, uh, you know, the, the content of Wood McKenzie here. Uh, next slide, please. So this will just quickly cover how, even though a lot of the focus was on ERCOT, um, there was there were a lot of other other areas of the country that were impacted as well. Let's let's go on to the next slide here. So here you can see on the left side of the screen you can see that this was a a very severe cold cold event um probably the coldest since 1989 depending on how you measure it between the February 12th and February 18th and so um and so it it, it had a lot of effects because of that it, it it meant that um you know all of these areas in the center all the ice ISOs in the center of the country ERCOT SPP MISO were all pretty heavily hit and had high demand um they also had high heating demand and natural gas usage from the residential sector and these all contributed to some of the things that happened in, in the ERCOT market in particular um well obviously I won't go through the number go through too much on the on the right side of the screen except that um you can see in the highlighted in yellow is when these different ISO or port ISOs uh or sub ISOs hit their their peaks in the past 5 or 6 years and historically um you know most of them are are summer are summer peaking but in this event uh, SPP was the only one um that the set all time new winter peak um but also most of them actually sitting stay below their uh, winter 2018 highs uh ERCOT set a new winter peak and all time peaks without load shed would have been would have been achieved if it, if they had been for the load shed but let's go on to the next slide please um one of the uh I don't know what happened with the formatting there but that's okay um the uh natural gas was a big stuff uh, side of the story and we saw record natural gas prices in the midwest at times hitting uh in what in some sub markets within Oklahoma hitting $1200 per million BTUs um per, in in context today I think the, I think the Henry Hub price today is about $2.90 so so that was a very extreme 
uh, and that was basically because natural gas supply ran out in the in the Midwest and some of, in some of these areas. And you can see the drawdowns that occurred on the right side of the screen from gas storage. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So, in terms of the power and the, the power markets, um, there's different levels of emergencies that you see. The first level, energy emergency one, is when you're basically at or below your operating reserve tar target in a, in a market. And uh, the grid operator warns uh, interruptible load customers to um, be ready to start curtailing load at that point. Uh, energy alert two is when you start curtailing interruptible load customers and, and, are, and your reserves to continue to fall. And then finally, energy alert three um, is when you start to curtail uh, firm load customers and you know residents, businesses, and things of that nature. So you can see that quickly, on, uh, very early on the morning of Monday, February uh, 5th, a number of the things happened in ERCOT with uh, generators tripping offline and the loads rapidly rising because of the cold wave. And it quickly went from energy alert one to energy alert two and then at EEA three, and then stayed at, at a load shed event for four consecutive days, which is pretty much pretty unprecedented in, in that area. Um, MISO, we, car, we, we talked about MISO in kind of two, two uh, sections. Uh, MISO South is kind of the old Entergy system that joined MISO back in 2014. And MISO Central North is the um, portion of the grid that, that's the traditional MISO footprint in the Midwest to, to the north uh, from like from Indiana all the way over in, up into uh, the Dakotas. And uh, there's only about 2,000 megawatts of electric transfer capability between those two markets. So they, they really can be somewhat isolated. So you can, uh, and ironically, even though it was colder in the north, the south was less prepared for it. And it was the southern part of uh, MISO that actually had some, some EEA2 and, and a little bit of EEA3 load shed events. And then SPP uh, was kind of right on the edge of Energy Alert 3 for, for several days. But for the most part, they didn't have too many rolling blackouts. It was mostly uh, interruptible load customers. Um, the and then on the bottom chart, bottom chart there, you can see the pricing that occurred. Um, ERCOT, the ERCOT North Hub saw prices up near uh, $9,000 per megawatt hour for, for a, a number of days, um, setting record pricing. And um, we, we calculated on the back of the envelope that um, the dollar volume of those four days was more than the energy market cleared in the previous three years. So it was a, it was a phenomenal amount of, of pricing and, and, uh, and an energy payment. Now there were, you know, there were generators that were big winners if they if they were able to be online and not have any outages um, and made a lot of profit um, in certain in certain cases. In fact, there was one there was one peaking plant in uh, that was built in Houston and it came online in February or in sorry in December. And it ran throughout the entire, this, this peaker plant ran basically as a base load plant for four days and, and made a lot of money, I'm sure. Whereas there were other uh, plants that, that didn't run because of outage and had, and some of them gone bankrupt or some are having trouble paying their ERCOT, ERCOT bills. So, so a, lot of, a lot of money changing hands. And in comparison, the other markets were, were uh, severe, uh, were also severe, but not as bad as ERCOT. SPP was, was pretty high pricing up to, from the two thousand to four thousand dollar range at times, uh, MISO overall was much lower pricing uh, throughout the event. Next slide, please. Uh, now, let's, so we'll look quickly at fleet performance. Um, I could really spend a lot of time on this, but I've got a few slides that I'm going to I'm going to highlight some of the key takeaways I think from the event. So if you could advance to the next slide, please. Um, so on, on the left side of the screen here, you see a chart that shows ERCOT uh, actually post outage data. They provided after the fact outage data every fifth, of every 15 minutes kind of by fuel type. So you can see that I, I like to refer to this as an all of, all of the above energy, energy failure um, in that, you know, people like to pick and choose like which technology was the worst performer during this event and cast blame and things like that. But really, they all, and at least in the ERCOT market, they all did pretty poorly. Um, the Winsley uh, had trouble because of an icing event that occurred back on, on February 9th and 10th. 
in the western northwest part of Texas and actually took out a lot of the wind farms several days in, in advance of this of this event. Um, but it was the morning of, of, of February 15th that everything really kind of fell apart where you had a number of gas generators kind of tripped off and then coal plants tripped and even even one of the units at, at the South Texas nuclear plant tripped off. Uh, you know, part of the gas outages were due to um, you know, equipment failure, and part of it was due to uh, lack of gas supply at certain plants. One of the uh, ironic things is that there are um, there are a number of gas supply facilities in West Texas, you know, pumps and compressors and things that are electric compressors that have signed up to be interruptible load customers um, in the in the ERCOT market, and so they weren't actually protected from the rolling blackouts. And so, so in, in a sense. ERCOT shut off some of the gas supply that was needed to run power plants, and that just made the problem even worse. Uh, you know, and some of the things that have come out in, in, as, as part of the, the things that happened. Um, and overall, you know, the biggest um, wind didn't produce very well, but it produced kind of as maybe as expected in an extreme weather scenario. Natural gas fleet per, per, performed pretty poorly. Um, if you know, if you had the gas leak kind of perform in a normal manner, you might have seen morning blackouts last for hours at a time rather than days at a time. Um, on the, there's less detail available from the Southwest Power Pool. That's on the right side of the screen. It's just daily outages. And they also kind of list the outages by fuel type um, in terms of their nameplate capacity. So that's just something you can look at and uh, we can ask questions later if you want to. Let's go to the next slide, please. Again, I'm sorry. The, the, the formatting that I'm seeing on the screen is a little bit different than our than our, our raw slide presentation, but it's it's still quite visible. So I think we're good to go here. Um, but I just wanted to point out a couple things. Um, people talk about some of the discussion after the fact was that all of those wind all of the wind turbine outages that occurred in the ERCOT market, if those hadn't and those are the and those are the light gray dashed lines in terms of the nameplate capacity. Um, that was off offline, and so in fact, you can see that of about 32 gigawatts of nameplate wind capacity that was was that was um, oper or potentially operating on Feb in February, almost 22 gigawatt out 22 gigawatts of that wind capacity was offline due to outage. Now we have a, a team at Wood McKenzie that looks at short-term analytics and real-time data. They used to be known as Genscape, and now they're part of our WoodMap Markets team. They, they actually have monitors on most of the wind turbines in West Texas, real-time monitoring data, and they also are monitoring wind speeds. Um, and so what they did is they did a, they did a modeled analysis of the, the, the orange line that you see here is the actual wind generation in the ERCOT market minute by minute or, or hour by hour at least. And then they did a theoretical look at if there hadn't been any of those outages uh, what would have the wind generation been? And that's what that blue line is that you see. And and so there are a couple periods during the event where you would have seen quite a bit more wind generation from the ERCOT fleet if they had been uh, they had been available to run. But the fact of the matter is that there was what we would like to refer to at Wind McKenzie as a wind famine that went that occurred for about five days straight. So there was actually very low wind speeds across the entire state of Texas and really up into uh, SPP and MISO as well, and so and so that means that even if you spend a lot of money to, um, you know, to, to to add de-icing equipment to the ERCOT wind fleet, you wouldn't have necessarily seen a large uh, a large uptick in uh, in wind generation during some of the key periods, like on the 16th or on or later on the 18th. Again, you would have still had some pretty low wind wind uh, contributions to the grid. Next slide, please. This is another look at the ERCOT supply demand picture over the period of, of the month of, for the entire month of February. And um, there's a lot to unpack here and I'll try to go quickly, but you can see at the beginning of the month, the loads, it was a fairly mild season and the loads were quite low. In, in the yellow there, you see that wind production was pretty much crushing uh, gas generation down to almost minimum levels. And even coal was getting back down. Uh, that, the gas is in green. Uh, the uh, wind is in is in the yellowish color there. 
coal is the light blue and nuclear is the dark blue. Then right around on February 10th, you can see when that icing event happened in Texas and it was starting to get cold and, and, and you could saw the, a big collapse in the wind production from that point on throughout the, and then all the way through the 20, about the 20th of, of February. So natural gas really stepped up and, and served and, and, and coal basically and ERCOT pretty much base loaded during that period and nuclear was just running as you would expect uh, during that event. Um, as you get to the, the vertical dash line there, that's right when the, the, when the kind of the emergency started and things started to fall apart. Um, the little, the little dash lines that are um, the load, the show of the load shed, those are where the peak loads would have been if there hadn't been uh, unserved energy. So we think that ERCOT would have hit an all time record peak of about 77 gigawatts on Monday, Monday or Tuesday mornings that week. Um, because there was so much, uh, I, ideally, natural gas would have risen and, and fell, filled in for the lock, for the lack of, of the wind generation there, but that didn't happen, as you know. And then also you can see that coal, coal at the bottom also had a, took a hit from outages and even one of the nuclear plants fell off there. So, so that's what, that's what created in, in aggregate, that's what created that large amount of, of unserved energy that occurred for four, four days straight, pretty much. So there were rolling blackouts continuously over that period in ERCOT. And then by the end of the week, um, after a lot of efforts to get the gas supply back and as temperatures moderated, um, the, you know, people had enough customers had dropped load that they could stop the rolling outages. And then following that, uh, temperatures really moderated, loads declined, wind picked up, and for the rest of the month, you know, things, things were kind of back to normal in, in the ERCOT market. All right, next slide, please. So the purpose of this slide is just to kind of show you the, the vastness of this event in terms of wind generation impacts. Um, the, um, the different areas of the, of the chart here go from January 25th to February 24th. This is data from the EI Energy Information Administration, real-time grid data. And they, mark, they break things down by different regions. So ERCOT is the ERCO region. Uh, Mid, Midwest is uh, kind of uh, SPP uh, or, and MISO. Mid-Atlantic Mid is mostly PJM. So things like that. But anyway, just to give you an idea of what this event looked like, you can see, and then comparing it to the prior year, which is just the aggregate total, of, which is the red line, you can see that there was, um, you know, you get a lot of volatility with wind as expected across the course of the month as, as, as storms come through and, and different things of that nature. But there was this extended, there was this extended period from the 10th of February all the way through the 20th where really wind across the entire United States kind of had this persistent lull and output that, um, that actually contributed to some of the other problems that occurred because it, it required the gas fleet and the coal fleet to really fire up. I started drawing down the gas demand pretty quickly. Now, if, if, if last year's wind generation had happened, if the 2020 wind generation had happened, you may not have had nearly as severe an event because you can, as you can see, there were some periods where wind generation exceeded over 60 gigawatts at times uh, last year, whereas this year during that event, um, you know, it, it had a hard time getting above 20, 20 gigawatts in total. And we kind of start, saw, saw this in the week leading up to the event as, the cold wave first hit the Pacific Northwest. You saw wind drop off there along with the cold, and then it kind of moved to the mid, mid, mid part of the country and south. So as you start thinking about the future where you want to replace coal and natural gas, you have to start thinking about these kind of events and what kind of alternative resources, energy storage, and things of that nature that you're going to need to fill in these gaps when these, these wind droughts occur. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, and, and the same, along the same lines, you can see that compared to 2020, where, you know, as we had a very mild, um, we had a very mild 2020, uh, we had COVID hadn't hit yet really in the United States, but the weather had been mild, gas, natural gas prices were super low, and coal, coal generation was way down last year, like, like down 30, 40% from 2019 levels. And then you can see, though, that during February here uh, this year, the coal generation just stepped up to the plate. <laughs> at the even though we, even even though it had problems in ERCOT at, at the U.S. level, 
coal generation really fired up to help kind of offset both uh, the high natural gas demand and, and pricing and also the lower wind generation and the high demand. So um, when coal almost uh, coal almost doubled compared to the prior year and during this period. And if all the coal plants retired, and that's just an extreme example, extreme scenario, but if, if you had no coal plants and this happened again, all else equal, you would have needed almost 90% increase in the gas generation uh, from the country uh, during this stretch. And we know that obviously the gas supply network was stretched thin. So, so that had, you know, you would need a lot more natural gas supply and storage to, to handle that kind of event a well, as well, or a lot more renewable energy and storage uh, to, co to compensate. Next slide, please. Okay, so. One of the things that people have talked about uh, as part of the, um, you know, aftermath of this is, well, if, if the, you know, if, if ERCOT had just had, you know, more transmission to connect it to SPP and MISO, you know, everything could have been okay. Um, and it, it's actually a little, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, and it's actually a pretty massive problem because you have to think about the fact that we're talking about almost a 20 gigawatt deficit in supply that happened over like a four-day stretch. So that, that would, you know, it's not just a few transmission lines you thought you would be talking about, it's some really large upgrades. But let's take a quick look at what the, uh, if you can advance to the next slide, um, one of my colleagues put this together. Uh, ooh, the formatting kind of blew up on us here a little bit <clears throat> for my PowerPoint. But um, basically, uh, you can't really see the numbers fully, but the PJM, uh, PJM was sending on average almost 7,400 megawatts uh, of power to the MISO market and, and CERC was uh, sending another almost three gigawatts to MISO. Uh, at times, I think uh, exports from PGM to MISO got up to over 12 gigawatts in certain hours, which is a all, like all time never been seen before. So a lot of power flew for, uh, that was provided from those areas. Um, MISO ended up keeping a lot of that power, but did ship some off to SPP um, and also received some more from Canada, and SPP received some from Canada as well. And then, um, but then you can see that SPP needed most of that power for itself. And there was really fairly limited transmission capacity between SPP and, and ERCOT. And only, only on average, only over this, uh, on the February 15th, only about 779 megawatts um, uh, were, were achieved. And so um, you can see on the chart on the left that this is the view from, and again, the, the formatting got messed up here a little bit, but this is the, from the view of MISO where it was getting power and where it was sending power uh, uh, to. Um, so on the top side of the chart, you can see the hourly imports from PGM, CERC, and Canada into MISO. And then on the bottom, side of the chart, you can see how MISO was sending power to, to the SPP market. So MISO kind of became this wheel through, and then SPP as well. Um, now, some people say, well, you know, we just need to expand that Western grid, the WECC grid to, um, you know, so that power from California can flow all the way over. But uh, in actuality, uh, a lot of this event was hitting the, uh, the, the Western or the Eastern part of the WEC grid as well. And gas prices were as high as $100 a mega per million BTUs, I think, in, in parts of New Mexico and Arizona and Southern California as well. So they were, they were stressed a bit as well. And in fact, we can look at the, if you look at the next slide. Oh, okay, before I, sorry, I jumped the gun a little bit there. This was just to show the ERCOT, from the ERCOT perspective. I'm sorry, no, you can go ahead and advance. From the ERCOT perspective, this is on the left side of the screen here, you can see that um, really, the, the interchange between ERCOT and other markets is often pretty minimal, um, but uh, starting around uh, February February 10th, ERCOT really started in, importing power from SPP, kind of kind of maxed out the SPP link uh, on the top top part of the chart there, and and, Mex and ERCOT even uh, imported a little bit from from Mexico for a few days. And then what happened was Mexico actually had gas supply issues as well, and they had no surplus e either at that point. Next slide, please. 
Um, and just to highlight the fact that uh, there wasn't a lot of surplus available from markets farther west, this is, a, this is a, again, EIA data for the uh, Public Service Company of New Mexico Balancing Authority for the month of February. And again, similar to what happened in ERCOT, the wind generation was really good during the first part of the month, and they actually tended to be more of an exporting balancing authority, uh, which you can see from the, by, the fact that they're, but by the fact that the negative part of the chart here in the first part of the month is actually showing that they're exporting power to neighbors. And then again, the same, around the same time, uh, they actually had a, had a coal outage probably for maintenance or, or, or they might have been a forced outage there, but they were still exporting power. They had plenty of wind, their gas fleet kind of picked up the balance. But then right around the same time on February 15th, um, same thing happened in New Mexico. They, were, they got hit by the same wind drought. Their uh, gas prices, exploded and they ramped back um, a lot of their, their gas generation. Uh, and then they also started importing from other parts of the WEC like Arizona. Um, Colorado was similarly challenged and they probably weren't importing much from, from Colorado, but probably from Arizona and, and California were, were importing a bit. So really they didn't have any ability to support ERCOT or the SPP markets because they were, they were facing their own challenges as well. Next slide, please. So, you know, was, uh, was this wind event and the wind drought kind of a one-off event so that we don't have to worry about these kind of cold snaps in the future or that, you know, with enough, you know, with enough wind build across the country, you know, that maybe this won't happen. And so we looked at, we've looked at a few other historical events here that I can, I can walk you through really quick. Next slide, please. All right. So this is, uh, this is a chart from uh, January of 2020 on the top part of the screen. And uh, this is showing you the uh, five Northeast ISOs, including, uh, including uh, the IESO, which is the Ontario grid operator. Sorry, four, four, four Northeast ISOs. Um, so you have New York ISO, ISO New England, PGM, and then oh, the Mid-Atlantic portion of PGM, because the PGM footprint is pretty huge and it can really access all of the wind that's to the west, and then the independent uh, system operator of Ontario. Again, you can see that here, are those, those four northeast, the northeast part of the U.S. faced about a five-day uh, wind drought event uh, in, in January of 2020. And, the, and then also in September of, 20, of uh, 2017, and September can be pretty hot and, and still in the Northeast, um, you had actually about three weeks of very low wind output in the, in the Northeast. So as you start thinking about futures where you're gonna be building massive amounts of wind in these places to meet the renewable targets and solar as well, the solar will help to fill in for the, uh, for the daytime hours, but you're gonna, at a minimum, you're gonna need probably 12 hours of battery storage, if not longer, to factor in the fact that you're not gonna maybe have the wind output that you might otherwise expect at times. And then if you look at the next slide, please. Um, you know, as probably many of you have heard over the last month, the Biden administration has really, um, has really committed to offshore wind with a number of initiatives by opening up, opening up new areas for offshore wind, new incentives. Uh, they approved the first large scale offshore wind lease, a wind farm, uh, the Vineyard Wind in, in the Gulf of Massachusetts. And so with the goal of almost 30, with the uh, Biden administration having a goal of the U.S. reaching 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by, by 2030, again, we've had a little bit of a formatting issue here. And I can send a PDF of my presentation after this that you might want to share with, with people, too, if, we, if, we, if you want to do that. Um, but on the, left, the left chart here is northern Europe. There was a, a wind drought in March of this year that... Um, then uh, impacted not only onshore wind facilities, but also offshore wind facilities at the same time. So the chart shows offshore wind uh, in the area chart uh, for Germany, the UK, Belgium, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And then the, the light gray at the top of the chart, the light gray area is all of the onshore wind across that same footprint. So the offshore wind had a lot of the same hourly profile and, and, and and generation patterns um, at you know incredible numbers at times reaching 25 gigawatts of output 
in parts of the month, but at the same time falling to less than about 2,000 megawatts for the entire North Northern Europe wind fleet um, uh, during during that stretch. And it's reasons like this that, uh, like last week, uh, a developer announced a potential project for the UK that would build a massive wind farm as far away as Iceland in the Atlantic, floating in the Atlantic Ocean, that would ship all of its power to the UK. And the sole reason for doing that is to add diversity of weather to the wind generation so that you can hopefully avoid these kind of simultaneous uh, wind events. But uh, the chart on the right can show you that for, for now, that the correlation between uh, wind, uh, onshore wind and offshore wind in Europe is pretty strong. So you can, you can often have low wind events, both low wind generation events, both for onshore wind and offshore wind, and you can have high wind generation events for, for onshore wind and offshore wind, and they're, and they're pretty strongly correlated. Next slide, please. Uh, we're almost at the home stretch here, but just talking a little bit more about winter being maybe becoming the new summer. If you uh, look, look at the next slide. Um, first of all, in terms of market design, you know, some people ask, you know, well, is, is ERCOT's market design really able to handle events like this? And it, it's kind of hard, hard to say. Um, I think most people, when they think of ERCOT, they think of a summer peaking system. And historically, that, that's been the case. Scarcity, up until this year, scarcity only occurred in a little bit in 2011 and 2018 in the winter. And most of the, and, and most combined cycles made like 90% of their revenues during the summer months in the ERCOT only market leading up to 2021 for the last 10 years. You know, the, that's, that's the, the vast majority of their revenues were within the, within the summer months. So of course, you know, now you have this 2021 URI event where, you, you know, you had some generators more making more money, you know, this year than they probably have in the previous five years combined. So it's a, just a, it's a huge, um, you know, it's a huge challenge, but at the same time, was there, there was really no incentive for a lot of these generators from an economic perspective to winterize because they just really hadn't seen much opportunity from, from the winter months for, for having their, their power plants be available. And right now there's a lot of proceedings going on in the Public Utilities Commission and the Texas legislature about uh, new market mechanisms or regulation that will be needed to maybe have the fleet be better winterized for future cold, cold events. So that's, so that's one thing to think about. Um, and the other thing is just a lot of people talk about climate change and that the winters are gonna get warmer in the United States and that and that's probably true, but at the same time, we're also seeing more volatile weather, and we can and there's really nothing to indicate that you won't see these kind of cold snaps happening, uh, you know, maybe even more frequently. But certainly, you know, there's certainly the potential for 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 very extreme cold, even in the context of an over, overall warmer climate. And you know, depending on you know your analysis of what happens with the polar vortex. And how those are the Arctic ice events can break out from there. You know, you might, these might even become more frequent. Next slide, please. All right. So again, a little formatting issue here on the titles, but the, this is uh, this is from uh, actually from a Wood McKenzie forecast. And we, you know, you've probably heard the term net load, and, and net load or net demand is what people like to look at in places like California where you have the duck curve for the solar where if you subtract if you take the load and you subtract out solar that's the net load and uh, on solar and wind that's kind of the net load that other resources that can be you know cycled on and off they have to dispatch to um, so that be, you know for you know, traditionally we always thought of demand peak demand as the as the critical period for reliability but now we're finding that um, the net demand, and we found this with the California uh, outages back in August and September of last year, it was those evening net peak hours when solar was falling off and wind was low, demand was still high. It wasn't the peak demand of the day necessarily, but be, when you factor in the, um, the lack of wind and solar, it became the net peak. And that's when the blackout, that's when the rolling blackouts in California happened as well. So this is our projection of when, if you, if you factor in our long-term forecast of solar build, um, uh, the, the years are on the bottom of the chart here on the left. Um, these markets at the bottom are historically winter peaking 
regions already. But if you think in terms of net peak after wind and solar, um, you know, you can see that we show a lot of the U.S. becoming net winter peaking um, uh, by 2030, and majority of the U.S. Um, as net winter peak in, in, in Canada by 2040, and just a handful of handful of areas uh, remaining um, remaining winter uh, remaining summer peaking for throughout the forecast. Um, and this was with a fairly conservative electrification assumption for building heating and for um, and for things like uh, water heating. So if you look at some of the plans from states like California and Massachusetts, New York, and wanting to have large um, large transformations of building heating to electri electrified heating, uh, you can see these you can see the actual winter peaks happen a lot uh, happen in these markets and 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 net peaks well before this. Um, some studies have, suggest, have suggested that the winter peak in New York can be almost twice the summer peak if you had full electrification of building heating demand, for example. So that's that's something to, something to con consider. And then um, the chart on the right shows kind of what's driving some of these net peak shifts, and that this is the penetration levels that get hit uh, when the, uh, from solar when they kind of shift to being net peak, net winter peaking because at that point you've kind of shifted the uh, the peak in the summer but the winter peak is really not impacted by solar because typically solar falls off in the in the in the by about 4 p.m. and you're you're getting your evening peaks in the winter around 7 p.m. so without storage solar's not doing a whole lot to reduce the peak so so that's another little piece of that of that information there and uh, that might be the last slide I think if we um, Advanced. Yeah, that, that's it. So, uh, so Nisha uh, uh, and others, if you want to unmute, uh, then uh, and if you have any questions, like I said, I'd be happy to um, I, I'd be happy to make a, a PDF version of the PowerPoint that I can share share as well. That'll have some of the formatting fixes on that. Um, but uh, but happy to take any questions now that you might have that anybody might have. Um, thanks, Wade. Um, yeah, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, a lot of things for us, you know, many of us building engineers uh, to learn about. Um, so I'll just maybe open up uh, to any questions that are there. So I see uh, some questions from Tim. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Well, I don't normally think natural gas outages during cold weather events. Can you describe to us and educate us a little bit what causes natural gas to go off in a cold event? Um, there were um, there were a number of wellhead free wellhead freeze offs that occurred in the Midwest. Um, there were um, again there were compressor there were compressors. On the pipelines that got um, that got uh, taken out by the electrical outages themselves, because they actually were part of the got impacted by the rolling blackout. Um, there was actually such a gigantic drawdown of gas supply that some of the pipelines were just literally kind of maxed out, getting power, getting gas into into northern Texas and Oklahoma. Um, and 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 just so much heating demand from from residential and things of that nature as well. So so there was that, and then but then there were just a lot of, of and then at the power plant level, the gas plants had just struggled with um, equipment failures, uh, cooling water freeze offs, um, you know different different things to cause them to trip. And there was also some, there were also a bit of voltage uh, as these things were tripping off rapidly. Um, you know, there, I think there were some frequency events going on in that early morning on on May, or sorry, on February 15th that kind of contributed that as well. Um, and then I, um, you know, ERCOT's done a bunch of presentations that also that you can go find on the ERCOT website, but just to, just to put a little chill down your spine, uh, um, by some people's reckoning, ERCOT was about 10, like about 10 minutes from having other units trip offline and causing kind of continued cascade that would have taken the whole 
the whole grid down potentially for weeks to months. <laughs> so they, it, it, luck, luckily that didn't happen, but, uh, but yeah, so that, anyway, the, a lot of things contributed to it, but yeah, the gas, yeah, the gas thing was kind of, kind of news to me as well as far as the gas supply, but, but several things contributed to that as well. Okay, well, thank you, Wade. I, I have another question if I can. Um, with there being more proposed offshore wind on both east and west coasts of the United States, will these mid-continent areas uh, benefit from that offshore wind on the coasts? Um, I mean, I think, you know, in, indirectly uh, they would, um, you know, a lot, I, interestingly, a lot of the transmission in PGM and MISO has kind of been historically designed to move power from uh, west to east rather than east to west. But there was a lot of east to west flows out of the PGM market um, during, during this event. And if you had more offshore wind, um, you, you know, but there's going to be a lot of coal closures in PGM as well. So, you know, so, so those will be gone. And those were based pretty much PGM, whatever PGM coal plants were um, still available or haven't retired, they were pretty much running full out during this event as well. So you're going to lose a lot of coal capacity over the next 10, 20 years, probably. Um, and it's probably faster than offshore wind will keep up. But it'll certainly, you know, it, it, to the extent that, that the wind is blowing on a day like this, uh, in offshore, um, when uh, when uh, there's no wind in the Midwest, that will help, and then it would allow them to maybe send more gas power from BJM or more wind, more solar power. Um, so it, it all, you know, it's all part of the same thing. But there is a limited amount of transmission currently. There would have to be a pretty vast transmission expansion to actually support ERCOT with East Coast wind. Um, I don't know. I don't have enough data on the West Coast wind patterns, but from my own experience looking at weather buoy data and things, things like that, uh, February winds on, in California can be pretty, pretty calm, on, and it, including on the coast and, and offshore, unless, there's a, unless it happens to be a winter storm blowing through. Um, so you, you know, there's no, there's no guarantee you're gonna get a lot of, a lot of wind output uh, from those either, but, but they, it, to the extent that they're producing, they certainly would help diversify the fleet mix compared to other resources. Excellent, thank you. Um, David Sapor, like I saw uh, you raise your hand. You have a question, please unmute and go ahead. Yes, thanks. <coughs> Sorry. First, Wade, uh, your, your posts on LinkedIn are a public service and I really appreciate uh, uh, all you <laughs> do you. there. Um, second, uh, could you provide a little color i had two questions uh i'd never heard that ERCOT was that close to cascading outages if if you have any more color on that that would be great and then i focus on the miso region and a big question stakeholders are having there is to what extent did miso actually need those imports uh from circ and pjm and in, in particular pjm um miso yeah. kind of won't won't answer that and they point to how much of it flowed to SPP, but it, you know, there was less flowing to SPP. So do you have any sense of, yep. of what was going on with internal MISO generation and, and whether it was, it could have been used or if MISO was just doing economic uh, imports? Thanks. Yeah, um, well, thank, thank you. Yeah, um, sorry, we're, we had two questions, right? What was the first one again? <laughs> A little color, little color on on ERCOT being so close oh, to yeah. testing. Yeah, um, I, I guess a lot of the nuclear units have a certain have a certain threshold for how many minutes they can be um, not providing or not having operating reserves or, or something to that effect. There's like a certain timeline, and then the, at, at which point they have to trip they have to trip offline and. Um, I have to go back and refresh myself, but that, that, that's, that's what I recall the, 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 the issue being. And so they were, there were some of these big units that had been sitting there with these, with, uh, with uh, frequency, like, oh no, sorry, not, not hot reserves, it was low frequency. There was, um, there's like a certain limit uh, which certain plants could have low frequency on the system and ERCOT was at, those, was, was at a low frequency because you had, uh, you had so many generators coming off and you still have load trying to draw on the system. 
that you didn't have enough voltage support and you didn't have enough frequency on the system. And uh, and a lot of these generators have these operating rules that if they're if they face low frequency, it can damage the it can damage their own equipment. And so if that extends for a certain amount of time, then they also have to trip off. So they were kind of right on the edge of if they that's why they just kept dropping more and more load to try to stay under that and keep the frequency up. Because if that if that had continued, um, then then those other generators would have started tripping off, and I think it, it would have quickly gone gone down to complete complete grid collapse um, with black you know black start kind of event, and you know with the weather being so cold and iced over and people locked in their homes and things like that, it would have taken it would have taken a long time for that for that to have un, un, unwound and. So then you would have had critical infrastructure offline as well, like hospitals and you know, uh, police and fire and everything else. So yeah, it was pretty bad. And then as far as the uh, the MISO thing, um, I mean, all I will say is, like I said, uh, yeah, they definitely were sending out. They were definitely importing more power than they were sending out, and they were also kind of at the EEA one to EEA two alert levels. So I, I think you know, I think without the PGM imports, they would they would have been struggling. And the other the other issue is there's you know there's some big coal plants in MISO that ran ran like a champ during this. Their 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 coal plants tend to be better winterized than ERCOTs because they they have cold they have cold weather every winter. So their their coal plants are ready for coal or are ready to be have a cold event. So they had they had many fewer coal outages, but and yet they still were on you know kind of on the ragged edge because of their gas fleet being uh, was also impacted by the some of the gas issues and, and just high prices. So, you know, you got, there's a big coal, coal creek plant up in North Dakota that's scheduled to go off in the next couple of years. It, it ran base load throughout this event. And there, there's a number of others as well. Now, the, the rest of the year during the high wind months, those plants are getting crushed, you know, by low pricing and, and you know, more, you know, more wind than people know what to do with. And, and so those plants are, are not making any money during a lot of the year. And that's why these owners are trying to, to unload them and build more more wind facilities, but you, you do have to wonder if those plant, plants aren't you know aren't there, um, you know what's going to happen. And to be fair, that's why one of the owners, uh, Great River, Great River Energy, that wants to sell off that Coal Creek plant, they uh, they're actually prototyping, or they're actually going to have a uh, have a demonstration flow battery project on the, uh, that's like one megawatt. Uh, that's supposed to have 168 hours of duration versus you know, your typical lithium battery, maybe two to four hours of duration. So some of the utilities are starting to see the writing on the wall of what kind of storage durations they might need in the future uh, if they have, have these kind of winter events happen. Interesting, thank you. Um, I guess, uh, like, is there any more questions uh, that people have? Um, if not, I have one question. Um, I'll go back to the slide where we actually have um, storage. So, so within this, like uh, this particular slide, I see that there was some storage was also offline, and what could be yeah. a reason for that? Um, so that was interesting to me. Um, you know, I, I haven't personally, I haven't looked at it, uh, what, what might have happened there. Um, I can imagine, I mean, these storage facilities have heating and cooling uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, here's the thing about storage, right? There was nothing to charge it with after the first, <laughs> after the right. first four hours of February 15th, there right. was no real surplus energy to charge it with at that point. And so, right, I right. mean, whether, you know, whether it was out or, uh, you know, whether, whether, whether it was out or just out of juice, I don't know what the, what the answer was on that. But storage was pretty minimal at that point in ERCOT in terms of total capacity, but there's a large amount of storage being built now. Um, ERCOT's projecting almost 1800 megawatts of storage will be online this, by this summer. Mm -hmm. But they, because they're uncertain about how it might perform, they actually aren't crediting any of its capacity when they do their summer assessment this year. Um, that's probably very, that's probably too conservative. I think, you know, solar is gonna, I mean, storage is gonna contribute during the peak, I'm sure, but they don't know how much. So right now they're, they aren't giving it any capacity credit in their, in their 
the liability assessment, but it's very likely that it'll, it, you know, it'll be there for most of the peak days. Uh, so, and, and there's a lot of storage in the, in the queue, in the interconnection queue. Interesting, a lot of it's being paired with solar farms that are in West Texas uh, or, or wind farms in West Texas, but there's actually a big transmission constraint to prevent power frequently from getting from West Texas to places like Dallas and Houston. Some of those places need to be is where the batteries actually would you know, be needed to you know, charge at night and then, um, and then be available. Uh, so, so I'm sure it'll evolve over time, but there's, there's, a, there's a large surplus of capacity in West Texas right now in the Panhandle, and uh, some of the shortages are coming in, in places in the North and Houston area. Interesting. Yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe I'll follow up with one more question. Um, so, sure. like, maybe in the next 20, 30 years, like, we'll have a grid which is completely clean and green. Um, mm -hmm. or, or maybe not. Like, what what do you see uh, as as our grid in twenty fifty? Like, how how would that right. be? Would it be like wind and and solar and hydro, or do you think that there will be coal or gas or maybe you know some other kind of thing which uh, ramps up? I mean. You got, I mean, people are going to laugh at me, but I mean, I've been doing this long enough to know that, you know, what we think today is not going to be what it's going to be in, in 30 years. I think when I started this career, we thought um, the U.S. would be building nothing but coal, or the Western U.S. at least would be building nothing but coal plants for the next, <laughs> in the next 30 years. And that certainly didn't happen. But, um, but I mean, I think, you know, certainly wind and solar are the incumbent easiest to think of, uh, quickest to deploy in terms of what we have available to us now to quickly decarbonize up to a point. <clears throat> We're then going to need storage in increasing duration, and, you know, and even California ISOs even recognize that. They Just last week, they, they put out a procurement requirement for, or they're on the verge of putting out a procurement requirement to replace the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, which would require some long duration storage uh, as soon as 2026. And they're also trying to get uh, geothermal, uh, and there's quite a bit of interest in geothermal all of a sudden as well, as a dispatchable, potentially a dispatchable renewable resource that, that can run base load most of the time. It can also back down if there's a surplus and, and ramp up, you know, when there when there's a shortage from the other types. Um, so I mean, you know, there could be in certain parts of the U.S. there could be some, you know, quite a bit of advanced geothermal. I could see. Um, I think there'll be battery i think there's so much money is going into battery storage of different types i don't think i think lithium ion will still play a big role but it might be more of a role in like you know electric vehicles than in stationary storage you might see a lot more things like flow batteries um and then there's the potential for a hydro some some sort of renewable natural gas renewable hydrogen or renewable natural gas um, you know, we've got um, LADWP potentially building a hydrogen powered combined cycle in Utah. Um, there's people talking about already about building hydrogen generation uh, facilities in West Texas to take advantage of all that surplus wind and solar to create hydrogen and put that into the pipelines um, and then synth ultimately synthetic natural gas. So those are some of the things. And then you know, again, with all this money flowing, R and D and money flowing into technologies, you know, maybe there will be some fusion finally. <laughs> maybe there yeah. will be small modular nuclear. You know, it's just, I mean, it, it's not, you know, it's not the leading candidate at this point, but I think we'll more than likely will be surprised, and we'll probably see a lot of offshore wind, but um, but it, it's not, you know, it's definitely a more expensive resource in terms of its raw. Um, levelized cost compared to other um, onshore technologies right now. But when you factor in that it's adding diversity, that might prevent the need for as much storage. It might tend to be located closer to load center compared to an onshore wind farm on the east and west coast. Um, so, you know, we might, you know, we might see a lot of, a lot more offshore wind as well. But um, offshore wind faces the same thing that onshore wind is starting to face, which is just the NIMBY challenge. And so I, so many people are starting to object to seeing wind farms in their neighborhoods and their backyard um, that it, that's becoming the biggest holdup, I think, in some ways, and lack of transmission. So distributed solar will probably have a, have a, have a big 
play a big role as well in, in terms of, of what we'll see. But um, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how they're going to get to that, this kind of 100% clean energy goal. And it gets even harder if you start retiring nuclear plants. Um, you know, my, my back of the envelope is that it takes about, um, you know, six gigawatts of solar, utility scale solar to replace one gigawatt of retiring nuclear capacity in terms of the same amount of annual energy production. So, so you know, right now, I think this week, some of the, the state of four nuclear units in Illinois might be decided. The owners pretty much said they're going to shut them down by the end of the year. Um, if uh, they don't get some subsidies uh, and right now that's still being debated, I think in, in Illinois. And so, you know, that would, you know, that would pretty much erase a, pretty much all of the clean energy build that's happened in Illinois up to this point in terms of the generation that they, that they produce relative to wind and solar. So, so that's something to consider. It does get much more difficult if, if the nuclear fleet retires uh, quickly. Well, thanks for answering my questions. Um, I'll right now like uh, stop share and uh, I will uh, let it open to the floor. So, any questions? Any final thoughts? Don't feel shy in asking a question. Just remember to unmute. <laughs> All right, I guess uh, like if we don't have any questions, uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, Wade, thanks so much. We really appreciate uh, you presenting it uh, to the entire group over here. And uh, we'll have you in future events as well. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And I'll try to, I'll try to make, a, make an event in person one of these days too, now that I know I'm in the same, same area here, so. Yeah. Thank you. All right, good one. thanks for having me guys. Bye-bye. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Wade.